interest in this topic and it's easy to see why. The trusted internet connection or TIC program is a foundational aspect of federal government agencies enterprise network cybersecurity. It's underpinned network architectures since the initial rollouts a decade ago. And now with the latest version, TIC 3.0, there's a major transformation underway. TIC 3.0 recognizes advances in technology and allows architectures that better enable and secure networks for mobile and cloud environments. I'm Kevin Gallo, the government chairperson for the Networks and Telecommunications Committee of Interest. I'm joined today with three experts from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency and General Services Administration. So batting first, playing center field, we have Sean Connolly. Sean's the trusted internet connection program manager and senior cybersecurity architect architect with CISA. Sean's been involved with the TIC program since around its inception. Among other achievements, he led the deployment and securing of the Einstein E3A solution and countermeasures. He's also a technical subject matter expert for continual diagnostic and mitigation. And he was a lead author of the NIST Special Pub 800-207 on zero trust architecture. Batting second, at shortstop, Joseph Drummond, also known as JD, and from CESA. JD is a cybersecurity engineer supporting the Einstein program. Prior to coming to CISA, he worked for the Space and Missile Defense Command in Huntsville, Alabama. Next up, Jim Russo from GSA. Jim's the technical director of the Enterprise Infrastructure Solutions Program and the chief for security and systems in the Office of Telecommunication Services in GSA's Information Technology category. You know, Jim is GSA's lead for the TIC program. He's also one of the key people who created the EIS contracts. You know, he was the technology lead for the EIS acquisition. You know, prior to that, he was GSA's satellite communications program manager. And among his many achievements here, he created the partnership between GSA and the Department of Defense for commercial satellite communications. So welcome, Sean, JD, and Jim. Over to you, Sean. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Kevin. And thank you to ACT IAC Council for this uh, opportunity to discuss TIC. Uh, first thing, I just want to make a slight mention. I apologize if there's background noise going on. My neighbor's tree company decided to cut down the tree this morning, and so there's a chainsaw about 30 feet from my microphone. So I apologize for that. Uh, but we'll begin with the, the uh, presentation. Again, my name is Sean Conley. I work at CISA and I lead the TIC program. And as Kevin mentioned, uh, I've supported the CDM program. The Einstein 3 rollout. More recently, I was one of the authors on IT modernization report, and then also the NIST Special Pub on Zero Trust. I think all those are important to where we are today with TIC. Next slide, please. Oh, you know what, let's, I'm sorry. Um, Jim, do you want to introduce yourself? And then JD, we'll introduce you, and then we'll go through the agenda. Sorry. Jim Russo. Okay. Um, thanks, Sean. Yeah, uh, Jim Russo here. Uh, Kevin pretty much gave you my background. Um, today, I'm still serving as technical lead for the EIS program. And also, uh, I am branch chief in the solutions development organization. Uh, actually, I work for Kevin um, under the uh, Office of Telecommunication Services. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll pass it to JD. Uh, good morning. The, uh, I support the Einstein program, specifically the E3A team. Um, I've been with DHS for about four years now, and uh, one of the co-leads for the cloud log aggregation warehouse pilot that's currently underway that you'll hear more about in our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, JD. All right, let's begin. We're on the second slide here with the agenda. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about TIC, then we'll move toward some evolving, uh, the, net, the evolving networks, the security challenges and strategies. We'll talk about the interim telework guidance that were released in April, and we'll talk about our engagements with the service providers. Then we'll pass the microphone over to both Jim Russo and JD to talk about their programs, and then at the end we'll talk about next steps. Next slide, please. Let's begin with a quick overview of the TIC initiative itself. Next slide, please. So we always start with the, when we talk about TIC, with the OMB memo. And just a quick background, Kevin mentioned uh, a few of us have been involved with TIC for a number of years. 
check is the federal government strategy on how traditionally the traditional agencies, government networks uh, are able to connect to the internet. And for a long time, that was the uh, uh, set up through a number of tick memos back in 2007 to about 2010, 2011. And the strategy was what you hear is that traditional network perimeter where there's a castle and moat where in, within the castle, that perimeter, all the, all the uh, access is granted and then everything that's not within the castle within, uh, outside that moat is considered external. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but I just want to familiarize everyone where tick started. And then last year, in September of 2019, OMB re released an update to the tick memo. Memo itself, it's uh, about four pages long, but when you read it, there's about four things you'll notice. First is the strategy. This, the, the new strategy in the memo allows for agencies to have a controlled expansion of their network per per perimeters and a controlled expansion of the prior consolidation requirements. The next is the architecture. When, when we have this uh, expansion of the perimeter, we need examples of how to uh, be able to still securely connect and monitor those environments. And so those are, these are called use cases, and we'll talk about use cases in a moment. And third is visibility. Ultimately, and the reason for the original TIC memo was for visibility. Uh, gain this telemetry and situation awareness, both at the agency at the perimeter, and then assist the Einstein sensors, the physical sensors that DHS uh, uh, supported that were located at these agencies' tick access points, these finite stacks uh, where the firewalls on the security me uh, measures were. And so this allowed this visibility, new ways to gain visibility. And when you read the document, there's this new tone. It's more about flexibility. For tick one, tick two, for a long time, uh, there was just this one reference architecture that most of the agencies uh, had to support. Now with tick three, it offers us these new opportunities, these new architectures. So that shift from defending and securing that single network boundary to a distributed, distributed secure architecture is the most fundamental change in the memo. It begins a transition from the internal external architecture I, meant, I mentioned before, more to multi-boundary and trust zones. The, the memo allows the guidance itself to be more iterative and adaptive to reflect these new uh, architectures and how technology changes will then reflected in these new use cases. The memo offers broader interpretation authorities to the agency's CIOs and CISOs. And fourth, uh, the new memo uh, rescinded the old TIC memos I mentioned from 2007 to 2011 or so. Next slide, please. At the same time, more recently, it's important to understand uh, other initiatives and activities outside TIC. I just mentioned a few. Uh, Kevin already mentioned the NIST Special Pub 800-2070 Trust Architectures that evolving set of cybersecurity paradigms, moving network perimeters, the static network-based perimeters, uh, more towards a focus on users, assets, and resources. And GSA, Jim Russo will be talking much more about this, but the uh, acquisition vehicle itself, the EIS uh, acquisition vehicle, encourages a number of forward-leaning technologies, SD-WAN, Zero Trust, 5G, cloud-based security. And then internal to CISA even, uh, JD will be talking a little bit uh, from the National Cybersecurity and Protection Services Office on what CISA is starting to do to monitor and pilot uh, the different cloud environments to support these new architectures. At the same time, the continuous diagnostic mitigation program, they're also moving to where they're piloting the monitoring of agency cloud environments. So I think these are just a few of the various initiatives going across uh, government to support these new architectures. So the next slide here, the, the program documents, just to uh, update everyone, we can capture these documents in two groups. The program guidebook, the reference architecture, what we look at as strategic and programmatic books. We look at the agencies using these two books to understand what is, uh, what is uh, the program now and understand the goals and objectives for the program. Then the other three documents, the capabilities, the use cases, and the overlays. These were looked at more tactical. These we believe the agencies will use on a more day-to-day uh, -day basis as they build out their architectures. It's important to understand that all these documents here were uh, built over a number of years. CISA has hosted a number of interagency working groups. They had participation from 50 plus agencies. At the same time through GSA, we've held a number of meetings and one-on-ones with each of the EIS 
vendors. Aside from that, we've also had deep dives and other meetings with cloud vendors, security vendors, agency themselves. And they've also done a number of pilots. So all those efforts are wrapped up into these documents. The next slide here, so I want to familiarize everyone with the OMB memo, which was released in March of 2020, harness technology to support missing continuity, target agencies to use the breadth of available technology to fulfill service gaps and deliver mission outcomes. OMB's memo allowed the TIC program to think outside the box in terms of what could offer to assist agencies during the telework search. The TIC program used OMB's memo as our green flag uh, to begin some new efforts. We'll talk about those in a moment. Next slide, please. So the, I mentioned the, uh, the new effort. So in April of 2020, to support the telework surge, CISA worked with OMB, uh, USDS, GSA, and others to release this interim telework guidance. We release this guidance, as we're hearing from agencies and vendors, that would help that we release some interim roadmap on how to use the new core documents uh, that we mentioned for a few slides ago. The questions were, what were solutions and architectures that would be considered in line with the spirit of the draft core guidance released in December? It's important to understand this document, this interim telework guidance, is not uh, part of those key core documents that we, I mentioned in the last slide. We plan to use the lessons learned from this guidance as we build out the remote user use case, which we'll talk a little bit later on. Next slide, please. Now I'll move the evolving network security challenges and strategies. Next slide, please. On the left side, we have that traditional perimeter that I mentioned before, that castle and moat, the old TIC2 architecture, where everything was trusted on the inside, and that primary barrier was that, uh, the, the moat, in this case, our case, the traditional TIC access points, where all the traffic flowed through those TIC access points when, they, when traffic was traversing from the external untrusted networks to the internal trusted networks. Uh, security at those TIC access points was more uh, protecting website browsing when internal users were surfing the web, or there were some DMZ services there at the TIC access points. Uh, and you'd hear about vulnerabilities in some of those services that, at the TIC access points, like a, a, an agency would typically host like maybe DNS or uh, their uh, mail systems. You'd hear about buffer overflow attacks to DNS bind or to send mail. But you really don't hear about those attacks as much anymore. Those services I just mentioned, the DMZ, those are more moving to the cloud. Those pr traditional on-prem uh, government agency users surfing the web, the on-prem networks, that's evolving too. So we don't hear about these same attacks anymore. And that OMB memo, 1926, updating the TIC initiative, reflects that connection model shifted, where before it was traditional assets, fixed assets and fixed networks, desktops and LANs, to where we've been for the last few years, less fixed assets and less fixed networks, meaning laptops and so on uh, on-prem Wi-Fi. And where we are today in just even the last few months, where it's an entirely new platform, which isn't fixed. We have mobile and tablets uh, on somebody else's network altogether. At the same time, we recognize that the attacks are shifting also. It's trying to, uh, um, and these, these attacks I mentioned, these are more general, I'm not saying these are specific to DACA, but across both industry, commercial, enterprise, and .gov, where you hear the adversaries trying to get the user to, to click on something, whether maybe it's a faked social network profile or maybe uh, click on a link in a messaging app. The adversaries scanning cloud services uh, for uh, services that were not protected correctly. The theme being those attacks are moving to where the traditional network controls are not located. The attacks themselves are shifting to that new perimeter. Next slide, please. So we mentioned the expanding network edge and how we're becoming much more distributed. The unrelenting adoption of cloud and mobile security, I'm sorry, cloud and mobile computing, disrupting the traditional infrastructure and security architectures and markets, forcing a redefinition, if you will, of network and security requirements. Organizations look to improve the enterprise network perimeter, uh, should strive to look at how new, uh, new types of WAN technologies hybrid, multi-cloud, uh, SD-WAN can be used. Move toward that philosophy of a strong workload, strong edge approach as agency assesses their best options for segmentation and monitoring their assets. And then also a strong identity management solution, which we'll talk about in a moment. Next slide, please. 
So at the same time, uh, some of this we've uh, used from Gartner analyst firm about the secure access service edge. We recognize that the data center uh, architecture is too rigid to support significant increases in remote workers. Organizations must be aware of how the business and threat landscape are shifting. In 2020, just the last few months, there's been that shift to threats with increased remote work and targeted malware campaigns that take advantage of the shift to telework. And the business trends themselves, we recognize that there's enriched data response capabilities emerging to improve detection accuracy and productivity. The process automation itself is becoming more automated to eliminate those repetitive tasks. And then also use an AI machine learning against those type of, type of attacks. Next slide, please. I mentioned before, trust zones were um, mentioned in the documents themselves and is reflective of the OMB memo. We introduced trust zones in our core documents. The trust zone itself can be, uh, it's a move toward micro segmentation networks, and secure access to the resources. The trust zone itself is uh, abstract. It's conceptual, allowing the agencies the flexibility to define their trust zones. The trust zone can be that traditional external, external model, I'm sorry, external and internal model we talked about before, but you can, we wanna uh, shrink that trust zone as much as possible. Ideally, that trust zone can be as small as an application or browser isolation. The trust zone itself can be around a user and their identity. The trust zone can be on a, a cloud container or an endpoint. Trust zones are used to secure those agency resources. The perimeter is now everywhere an enterprise needs it to be. The perimeter can be dynamically created, policy-based, that secure access service edge uh, we mentioned before. Ideally, we wanna shrink that trust zone down to as small as possible. Shrink that attack vector down as small as possible. The TIC program allows the agencies the flexibility to determine their trust zones. Next slide, please. So if we apply that zero trust zones to zero trust, uh, there's been a lot of activity and interest in zero trust in the last uh, few months and the last few years. Uh, mention a little bit about zero trust. Uh, if you look in the upper right-hand side, that traditional security model, the external and internal that we've talked about before, where traditionally an agency user would supply credentials, those credentials would be validated, and then the user would be allowed access inside the castle, inside the agency's perimeter. Now that trust model, some of the same principles, but it's now more of a loop where the credentials are supplied, the credentials are then analyzed, trust is established, but then at the end, that trust is reestablished. It's always continually reassessed. So trust now, unlike before, it was static and defined and permanent by the users uh, within, the, within the network. Now, trust decomposes. Trust decays over time. Trust has a half-life. At the same time, trust is reestablished, uh, and there's a number of um, elements that can be used to reestablish that trust. I mentioned the, having a robust identity credential and access management solution. The, the access controls themselves, gaining permission to access an environment, whether it's cloud, whether it's a resource on site. There's now a much more granular control of access controls. And also, there's other, uh, other concepts also. Network analysis, telemetry, threat intelligence, all those can feed into the trust algorithm. Next slide, please. When we talk about zero trust, though, it's important to understand that trust by itself, when an agency implements a zero trust architecture, they have to understand how that new architecture will impact the entire incident management process. And I'll just take an example here of the detection and response phase of incident management. If an agency implements a zero trust architecture, what does that mean for the collection abilities? How does the collection abilities change in a zero trust environment? The analysis, the analyst, as they are now receiving telemetry and situational awareness, possibly from different sources with different contexts, different fidelity. What does it mean for the, the analysis of that data? When all this data is coming in and maybe all these new flows are coming in, how does the agency prioritize? What's important to recognize? What may be just part of the, the noise or the chatter in the background? Then ultimately, the zero trust environment, how does the zero trust environment now impact the resolution as an agency looks to resolve issues, how does, how does it have to change when a lot of the underlying network is more ephemeral now? Next slide, please. And I mentioned visibility 
in the OMB uh, memo, in the uh, visibility discussions, there's really two different camps. There's a monitoring uh, camp and there's an observability camp. And I just, we bring this out to make agencies aware of the differences between monitoring and observability. Monitoring is more about um, uh, observing, I'm sorry, monitoring the known unknowns, understanding the system that's being monitored. Uh, monitoring is more very specific, more towards system logs and uh, metrics. It's more very tightly focused aperture. Observability is more about uh, uh, watching the unknown unknowns, gathering a baseline and looking for abnormalities. The observability is much more abstract. High cardinality, meaning where you're having a lot of different items uh, observing the system. And then also high dimensionality, where different contexts, different ways you can look at that same system. What does that system look like in a normal environment? What does that system look like if it's uh, doing a backup? What does that system look like if another system's accessing it? So all these different viewpoints, if you will, to, mo to observe the system itself. And the observability is more broad focused. So where you have a very narrow aperture with a monitor and observability, it's more about having a very wide aperture itself. Ideally, that visibility, what does that do? Increase the accuracy of, of the data that's available to the analysts, improves efficiencies across the different uh, analysts and also the engineers and architects, strengthens collaboration between the different environments, and ultimately gives mission resilience. Next slide, please. So implementing a zero trust architecture involves extensive planning, both in the architecture and design phase. We don't look at zero trust as a rip and replace, as much an augmentation of the agency's current architectures. The interim telework guidance that released before accommodates various uh, architectures, from the traditional network architecture that we mentioned before, the TIC2, internal, external, and, but also as we uh, build toward micro-segmentation, dividing these networks up and as they become more distributed and ultimately toward a zero trust environment. Offers agents to embed those security solutions and services and countermeasures where the agency best believes those services will secure their environments. Next slide, please. Okay, now we'll go into a little bit, a deep dive of the interim telework guidance that released in April. Thank you. So just to familiarize everyone, the uh, guidance itself is intended for scenarios where agency teleworkers are accessing sanctions cloud environments where uh, whether they're going to an infrastructure as a service cloud environment, a PaaS or a SaaS environment. That's the scenarios where this interim telework guidance is uh, reflective of. The document itself is intended to be architecture agnostic, meaning it can be used for a wide range of architectural implementations, from the traditional VPN to virtual desktop to the zero trust environments. And ultimately, the guidance is not meant to be prescriptive. Instead, it should be leveraged by agencies and adapted for practical teleworking scenarios. Next slide, please. This is that traditional telework security pattern. Or where the agency campus in the middle there, as you see, the agency campus is where the TIC access points are. And it's a very notional concept. Some agencies have their TIC access points at headquarters. Some of the agencies have TIC access points, more data centers, and other ones have a more uh, uh, internet hotels. But we just say the agency campus is where the, the different um, teleworkers remote sessions on the left side uh, flow through that agency campus and then go out to the cloud service provider. Again, this is the traditional model, but scale this out, especially in the last few months. I'm sorry, if you can go back one slide. Oh, no, you're right. Okay, you're there. I'm sorry. Uh, aggregating the telework traffic through those, the uh, agency campus. But now when you start to have tens of, tens of thousands of workers flowing their sessions through the agency campus. It doesn't start to scale well. We recognize there's additional resources, uh, incur greater costs, and decreases performance. If you heard any of our prior webinars, this is the tick tax that we mentioned in prior webinars. This cost, the latency involved. Next slide, please. So in the telework guidance, we provide a number of options for the agencies to consider. And I won't go into these in detail, but these are all explained in the telework guidance. Option one, is where an agency teleworker can now go to the cloud environment itself. Option two is more reflective of that model we mentioned before, which is still a possibility for a large number of agencies, was teleworkers uh, uh, had their traffic flows flow through those tick access point at the agency campuses off to the cloud providers. The third is the new model, one we're still exploring with some agencies, how the uh, agency teleworker, as they go to the cloud service, 
the services traverse a uh, third party in the middle, some type of uh, CASB, a cloud access service broker, or some type of service in the cloud. And again, each of these are described in detail in our uh, guidance. Next slide, please. Also, and I mentioned the details, this is part of the details, uh, we have the capabilities. In TIC 2, there's a number of capabilities. In TIC 3, we've kind of shifted how they are grouped and categorized. In TIC 3, the capabilities are broken out into two large groups. With the policy enforcement capa capabilities, the PEP capabilities are. Those capabilities are uh, more reflective of the use cases themselves. We'll go through this in a second. The universal capabilities are more the enterprise level capability and apply across all use cases. We include the universal capabilities because we want to make sure agencies are still aware of the responsibility toward those different capabilities. But really the focus of our uh, different use case and examples and architectures is toward the PEP capabilities. We give much more detail on the PEP capabilities and what the agency should consider. It's also important to mention that the capability list is not exhaustive. It's additional security capabilities may be deployed by agencies to reflect their risk tolerance, early adoption of security capabilities, or maturity level existing cyber programs. Next slide, please. And this is just a list I mentioned. Uh, we have a number of capabilities and we took from a greater catalog of security capabilities embedded in the telework guidance, the capabilities we think are necessary to protect those environments with the telework. And this is just a high level listing of those different groupings. At the same time, the very beginning, I mentioned how the tick memo is more iterative and adaptive, allowing for uh, new capabilities to be introduced. On the far right column, the Unified Communications Collaboration PEP Capability Group, the Data Protection uh, PEP Capability Group. Those are new groups that we um, created when we released the telework guidance. It released other use cases, and we'll talk about other use cases in a moment. There may be other capabilities that we want to introduce. Next slide, please. And then I also mentioned the enterprise, the universal capabilities. These are what we consider more in the background. They're very important to agencies uh, recognize and support all these, but the focus of the use cases themselves are not on these uh, capabilities, but we do offer guidance, tailored guidance for each of these. It's also important to understand that each of these capabilities we list out is mapped to the NIST cybersecurity framework, the six different categories to assist agencies and give a crosswalking, if you will, from the tick capabilities back to the cybersecurity framework, so they can map back to the 853, the NIST uh, security controls. Next slide, please. There's a number of caveats when we release this interim telework guidance. The guidance I mentioned before is not part of the TIC documents that were released uh, in December, the draft documents, does not support an existing use case. The traffic to the public internet should still be routed through the TIC access points, in, which include the Einstein centers. Agencies interested in adopting telework guidance may work with service providers to begin to implement those capabilities and discuss telemetry options. Next slide, please. Talk really quick about service provider engagements. Next slide. So on the end here, it's what we call the overlays. You may have heard about the overlays. The overlays are to uh, fill a gap that we recognize. The overlays themselves are not mentioned in the memo, but the overlays purpose is to help agencies understand some of the vendors' uh, services that can, uh, can meet the tick capabilities. So we've uh, prevented, prevented this table, this appendix in the overlays and the vendors can then begin to uh, build out those overlays and build out their material to show how the vendor services can map back to the overlays. The vendors align their products and services to the te te telework security capabilities. You know, we expect agencies to utilize these overlays to identify products and services the vendors offer that fulfill the guidance in a way that meets the agency's risk tolerance and business mission needs during the telework search. Next slide, please. With the uh, overlays, there's a number of caveats to understand though. Agencies should utilize overla overlays to understand the coverage and gaps offered by security, private, uh, security vendor services. Security vendors themselves are responsible for producing and distributing those overlays. The overlays will vary in content and appearance as service providers uh, customize the CISA template to meet the service provider's needs. It's very important to understand to the agency that CISA does not adjudicate or endorse any particular overlay. We do not attest to the strength of the mappings or validate the implementation of those um, overlays. Next slide, please. All right, at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Joseph Drummond. Next slide, please. JD is going to 
give some background on where we are toward the national cybersecurity protection systems. JD. All right, hello again. So the, the NCPS released the CIRA, which is the Cloud Interface Reference Architecture document earlier this year. They're, during later on the summer, we'll be releasing the, the second iteration of that. Um, and it'll, we'll discuss that in later slides. Next slide. And so, because and, and to kind of connect it back to what Sean was discussing, as agencies do leverage the TIC 3.0 kind of kind of method in implementing security controls, the one of the things that that have come out in discussion is with the pharmacy agencies leveraging CASBs, leveraging cloud environments. How is then Einstein going to get logs from from those data rich environments? And NCIRA kind of speaks to that. The, as, as, as the departments and entries do leverage third party cybersecurities and start to go directly to cloud resources, where NCPS, the NCPS program is evolving to meet that, that change in the environment. And of course, you know, cloud has been here for a while. And so to, to make, to ensure that we have that visibility, um, we're, we're increasing our capabilities to, to, to meet that challenge. Next slide. And so as you guys know, the Einstein program, or E1 specifically, monitors network flow data from departments and departments agencies via the trusted internet connection and MTIPS. And so as, as where there's the decoupling from the TIC architecture, and we're moving from, from that kind of historical legacy environment to one that takes more advantages of what of what um, cloud service providers and security service providers are leveraging. We want to make sure that the NCPS has the ability to take the VPC flow logs and other type of, of flow logs from departments and agencies um, cloud environments to be able to provide and see our uh, CISA that situation awareness. Next slide. Okay. So for, for right now, the, the pilot or the, the claw pilot, we're really focusing on collecting that E1 net flow like information. And so, and, and, and in the pilot, we, we, and we have the volume one speaks to the, to the architecture, but volume two really goes into detail in the use cases of how we want those flow logs presented to the Einstein program. Next slide. And so this, this kind of lays out the architecture for that environment. You have the agency's cloud uh, data and then those, those logs will be ingested into the cloud log aggregation warehouse. You know, it, it'll be ingested, stored in, in, in an S3 bucket, and then we have analytics on the back end that we'd be able to leverage against those data sets. And so not, nothing, I, to, to go back real quick, I, I would say that the, if the, this is a simplistic view of things, but when, when we just think about departments and agencies leveraging cloud resources and, and the diversity of the environment that exists today from a cybersecurity perspective, the, uh, the, real, the real beauty about the, the clause being able to ingest flow like logs from multiple different sources. Next slide. And so this is, and then as we, of course, as we enhance the capability, this is only the first step. Of course, uh, I think departments and agencies are familiar with what oh, Einstein 1, Einstein 2, and what E3A does. And so for this specific pilot, we're focusing on, on flow logs. And the agency would be responsible for configuring their cloud environment, but it, it's really a collaborative effort between departments and agencies, vendors, and CISA. You know, we have a number of departments and she's currently a part of, of the CLAW pilot and the ways that they present those flow logs to the CLAW environment is, is very varied. Everything from CASB solutions or directly from AWS environment or Splunk, Splunk converted into JSON files. It's, it's, it's a flexible built architecture to anticipate all the variances of which logs can be recollected. And like I said earlier, volume two of the, the cloud interface reference architecture will have specific use cases that speak to this. Next slide. And so what, what this slide kind of depicts, if you look at it from left to right, 
it starts we're looking at a traditional NCPS via a tick environment and so and as you slowly migrate from from left to right you see things slowly changing basically you know as Sean said that that decouple decouplization from the architecture to capability and so and and even CISA and the agency's role shift as we we meet that that um or adapt to the current environment and so by the time you reach the platform of a service column uh scissors role is more generating the iocs or indicators of compromise but the the shift to what the agency responsibility is and what what scissors primary responsibility is is shifting to anticipate future offerings and kind of more of a shared model and so it, it might some folks view this as it potentially might be some additional work for departments and agencies, but in terms of flexibility and and CISA's ability to to work with departments and agencies to to come up with solutions that fit this model, I I think, and I can only speak for myself, I think as we see the department and agency environment gets more flexible, and 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 more leveraging third party cybersecurity services, access to the cloud, I I, I think that's when the the beauty of this of this model really comes into play. Next slide. And so uh, this slide depicts a kind of a description of, of the architecture you see from left to right, the agency cloud environment, one and two, pushing those logs to the CISA, to the CISA, um, basically an S3 bucket, that S3 bucket uh, data, which is which holds that specific department agency data is then ingested into the CISA HQ environment. And that's where you'd, you'd have our analytics on the back end. Uh, you, we would have the ability for our analysts to be able to assess and monitor that traffic and, and, the, and the box to the right in cloud region Y kind of depicts something similar. So you, you would be able to have different regions, right? Of course, and that's kind of the beauty of being able to leverage a, a cloud architecture. It, it increases the flexibility of what we can do. It also uh, decreases latency because you'd be able to have regional instantiations of, of the architecture. Next slide. And so what, what this cloud is, 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 is showing, I mean, what this side is specifically showing is that there's, there's definitely not a co-mingling of data. I know after we, we've had the discussion about with the parts and issues that there's definitely a lot of concern about what's happening to their data as it's being ingested into the system and and so th the same way where you would have an e1 collector on your prem collecting net flow data and it's ingested into our data warehouses this is we're really getting at the heart of that but in the cloud environment and so the same data protections that exist today for agency data would exist in this environment next slide I, I think uh, that, that's it for me. Back to you, Sean. Thank you, JD. Thank you very much. And I'll turn over at this time to our favorite shortstop, Jim Russo from GSA. Jim, over to you. Okay, thanks, Sean. And, um, and uh, thanks to uh, ACT-IAC for inviting us to uh, make this presentation this morning. Uh, so uh, I usually, when I, when I do these briefings, I usually start with the report to the president on federal IT modernization back in 2017. Um, it did more than just identify EIS as a primary acquisition vehicle for modernization, but it also encouraged agencies to uh, move to the cloud uh, and uh, try to remove impediments to go to the cloud. Uh, in addition, increasing the cybersecurity posture of not only each agency, but the federal government as a whole. So uh, as far as you know, collaboration goes, uh, we were already on that trail with CISA. Uh, we started working together on EIS requirements um, well before 2017. Um, back in 2014, as we were developing the requirements, we decided that it made a lot more sense to boil the uh, security requirements into the services rather than just follow a bolt-on security model as, as we had before. Um, just feeling that you know, an enterprise security kind of, uh, as you were developing a network architecture, uh, made a lot more sense, sort of a, uh, you know, a, 
a sec DevOps type of uh, arrangement. So uh, we look to that, and when you, when you look at the EIS contract, we incorporated uh, cybersecurity policy right up front. Uh, it was weaved into the technical capabilities of all of our transport services uh, under EIS, and uh, also the traditional uh, tick, I'll call it, MTIPS services were available, but we, we had an eye to the future, and we looked at um, putting building blocks in our managed security service area to allow us to move forward later, uh, make sure A, we were in scope, and B, we were flexible to add those new solutions as they became available. Um, so in order to get there, you've got to have sort of the baseline architecture, network architecture to allow the cybersecurity modernization along with the standard network modernization. So a number of our basic use cases with agencies have been moving them from circuit switch voice to IP based voice, uh, going from TDM circuits to ethernet and looking at what guidance we can give agencies as they uh, look at their MTIPS solution today and move into uh, uh, TIC3 solution sets uh, later as, they, uh, as their architecture evolves and as the solutions evolve. So uh, to that end, we, we uh, went out and we, um, we did a couple of things. We made available or made, uh, made it very clear in the scope of the of the contract that we were looking for innovation uh, in terms of software defined networks um, and uh, wireless, especially 5G. Uh, so as time has, has elapsed, we've uh, recently added the software defined wide area networking service uh, as a defined service under EIS. And we've also uh, looked at better ways to employ uh, our transport options to get agencies to the cloud. Uh, the security building blocks I've already mentioned. And finally, um, we want to leverage as much as we can in terms of cloud-based uh, security services and tools. You know, as you noticed from Sean's uh, security patterns, uh, uh, slides he had earlier showing different ways that users can get to cloud resources. Uh, uh, policy enforcement points you know, could take a number of forms. They could be software as a service based tools. They could be native cloud uh, security services, uh, or they could be uh, you know, other third, uh, third party uh, solution sets that are sort of overlaid on, on that connection. So um, you know, to that end, you know, we're, uh, we're looking all the time at you know, how we just to make sure that we have the way to accommodate those services under EIS. Um, so, you know, TIC isn't really the only thing that GSA supports here. Uh, you know, we do through our different contracts and different programs support cybersecurity as, as a whole. Of course, we have the FedRAMP program um, to certify cloud services. Uh, we employ that actually in concert with EIS in that we ensure that uh, any cloud service that's offered through EIS has FedRAMP certification. Uh, we also support the CDM program, the Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation um, Office program office um, through our Alliant program. And we look very carefully at each of those programs to see where we might have almost too much overlap, I'll call it, where uh, we have requirements in EIS that are already taken care of let's say in CDM. So, uh, you know, it's more than just everything focused on EIS. We're, we're working as a team within GSA to make sure that we look at the whole picture. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and uh, this really is just a kind of a stick figure <laughs> diagram. Um, it, uh, but it does, I think, get across the point that you need to have baseline modernization in place uh, to enable a TIC3 or a zero trust implementation. Uh, if you're trying to do this without an SD-WAN uh, type of network or architecture, it's gonna be hard to do micro segmentation, for instance. So we see the modernized transport through ethernet, SD-WAN capabilities to better manage, uh, you know, more efficiently manage uh, network resources, um, getting to the cloud securely uh, does enable TIC 
which in turn um, all works together with those technologies to allow zero trust architecture, for instance, to be to be deployed um, and accommodate an IoT um, set of uh, requirements. So it's really a synergy that I think we've set up to um, to take basic modernization, apply it to cybersecurity, and it kind of feeds on itself in a in a loop, sort of like a zero trust architecture loop that uh, Sean described. Next slide, please. Okay, so what have we done on EIS specifically to uh, to basically move forward with with the technology refreshment uh, in general and tick in specific? So uh, we've looked at the tick policy, and obviously CISA has helped us with this. You know, going back and looking at the requirements we already had on contract for um, the the security policy. Uh, you know, we start out right away talking about the security policy that we apply to all the services. Um, and you know, that obviously needs some updating. So we've kept that current. Um, we've, as I mentioned earlier, added a defined SD-WAN service. So that's now basically a set of CLINs that can be ordered uh, through EIS. Um, we have updated the cloud service provider uh, connection capability. And it's right now it's a feature on our transport services. Uh, we realize that our industry partners on EIS are busy adding software as a service and security tools to their cloud catalogs. Cloud is in scope uh, of EIS. You know, we didn't really envision that EIS was going to be um, a way to, uh, our, a way for our service providers to resell uh, cloud compute, cloud storage. But we did realize that a lot of cloud tools would be part of solutions or maybe an entire solution. So we wanted to make sure that was in scope. And as I said, we applied the FedRAMP requirements to that. Um, but, you know, and we're encouraged that our, our, uh, our service providers are looking forward as well and adding those services to their cloud catalogs. Uh, so let me talk about MTIPS for a while. Um, Managed Trusted Internet Protocol Service. Um, as folks know it, love it and uh, use it anyway. Uh, the, <laughs> even if they don't like the price. The MTIPS remains pretty much the same. It's available as a uh, service that, of course, met the TIC 2.2 reference architecture, uh, although you know, that's been superseded by the TIC 3 reference architecture. Uh, it's still a viable baseline for a number of agencies. Now, it's not the most efficient baseline if you're talking about a widely distributed agency network uh, you know, for moving, it's moved a lot of resources to the cloud, uh, may still have some on-premises, may still have the, some hosted um, in different places. So uh, it's not the most efficient and we realize that and we encourage agencies to really look closely at moving to a TIC3 type of a solution instead. And to do that first, they've got to determine their requirements. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, there at least is a baseline here with the MTIPS to start that, that process. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, since we've managed both the CDM and, and TIC programs, you know, through the MTIPS uh, service offering, we've also looked at the deliverables under there. There was a pretty extensive list of deliverables that we were imposing on our service providers we've decided that we can relax some of those because they're already picked up in the CDM program. So, you know, when we can do things like that to sort of lighten, lighten the load on the service providers, but yet not sacrifice any security, uh, we're, we're definitely going to do that. Um, and the, the next thing to come really is, um, and the challenge for us is, you know, creating a tick three set of service solutions um, that's consistent with the TIC3 guidance coming from CISA. Um, there's a way to do that now. Uh, it does rely on the agency setting up the requirements and really kind of the use of the overlay concept that, uh, that Sean mentioned. In fact, when we did our TIC3 RFI uh, after the uh, CISA TIC3 RFC that happened early in the year, um, we did we didn't get those overlays sort of by default. You know, companies were very eager to tell us, 
which services met what requirements under the uh, under the tick umbrella. So we already had sort of a notion that that mapping could occur pretty easily. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are we doing to help agencies you know, navigate this path? Uh, we've developed a statement of objectives template, template already, uh, both for WAN modernization, so a set of requirements to employ SD-WAN, and also for implementing TIC-3. Um, we borrow heavily from the CISA guidance documents. Um, we, uh, we reuse wherever we can to try to, to uh, make sure that we're in step, but uh, we do know that it's possible today to employ a TIC-3 solution through EIS using a combination of managed network services, managed security services, uh, cloud services, and uh, the, uh, the equipment needed to, to put that in place, equipment and software. Uh, we have a, a solicitation assistance tool, which we call the SAT tool, which is always confusing to me because when I say, when I hear SAT, I think SATCOM since I was on that program so long, but um, the SAT tool does have modules, and we use that with agencies to sit down with them and sort of map their requirements into a EIS solicitation. Um, so, you know, we will build that out as time goes on to you know, be specific to certain TIC3 use cases. Um, certainly, we've already done that for SD-WAN and, um, and other applications. So, next slide, please. All right, and this is just a continuation of that. You know, we've uh, sort of mapping or leveraging the CISA documents, the, uh, the guidance documents, and applying that to a set of setting up a set of requirements in terms of capabilities, functions, and which EIS services are best uh, tuned to to meet that set of requirements. Uh, the table there is just notional. It was uh, from a very early document that that CISA shared with us, but we do think it gets the point across of trying to map capabilities to functions to solutions. Next slide, please. So in general, we've been telling agencies, there are things you can do now, even if the uh, CISA tick guidance is still labeled draft, um, it's still very good, and you can start using that right away to build your set of requirements to, um, to build into your network. Um, you try to get solutions to the network. So uh, we've, it's pretty basic. It, it, in a way, it follows some of the transition guidance that we've uh, given previously, which is first, you have to determine what you have in a network if you're an agency. You've got to figure out what you have, where it is, who's using it, um, and then determine what's the risk factors that you need to take into account. Um, you know, what, who needs access to, you know, what data or what acts or what uh, applications, and then at the same time, those data and applications need to be protected from unauthorized users. Um, there's agency best practices that we know can be leveraged. Uh, there's been some pilots that have been pretty well advertised. SBA comes to mind. Um, they've done a lot in terms of piloting uh, SD-WAN and, and TIC type solutions. So um, you know, that can certainly be a data set to be looked at and, and, and used. Um, we've also uh, got the uh, ability to not only leverage that, but use the guidance documents and employ the built-in requirements that we've got in EIS. The uh, managed network services, managed security services, and uh, the soon to come you know, flushed out managed security services with the TIC-3 uh, built in. So uh, with that, uh, let's see, I'm trying to recover my screen. Hopefully I did not lose uh, video or audio when that happened. Uh, there's the templates, as I said, in the SAT tool. Um, obviously agencies, when you look at the guidance that came out um, from OMB in their policy memo, um, agencies were required, not required, but encouraged to do uh, pilots or proof of concepts on their own. We knew they were doing that already um, and you know, continue to do that. It may not be necessarily formal pilots that um, 
that are you know being conducted in public but we also know that a number of the agencies have partnered with uh, service providers or potential service providers to, to do proof of con proofs of concept and we we encourage that as well uh, you know when you look at sd wan when you want to deploy that uh, the um, you know, there's still a couple of ways to look at it, which we think also are relevant for TIC, which is, you know, you know what's what's the agency's ability to, to do this on their own? So, you know, some of the larger agencies, of course, have a pretty well-staffed CIO shop. They can do this on their own. Um, others need to hire an integrator. So um, with that, I will turn it back to Sean for next steps. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, JD. Kevin, I see you on there. I know we got four minutes left. I only got a couple slides. You want to just run through these, Kevin, or what works? Yeah, well, I mean, Next Steps is a good way to end, uh, end the briefing along with Jim's slide there, you know, kind of like things for agencies to do. But I, I hope the, the three of you don't mind staying on a little bit extra to field some questions. I see we already have a couple of them coming in through the, uh, through the chat. Okay, yeah, I'm available. Yeah. Okay, uh, so we'll... we'll blow through these ones really quick. So just the in, the guidance that we released, how does this all work together? So the use cases, the capabilities, the overlays, you can see the interim guidance, all this feeds into the agency's risk management. In the background, of course, agencies reflecting the uh, cybersecurity framework and also the 853 controls. This guidance that we're releasing is all notional. It's conceptual, it's abstract, it's theoretical to provide agencies the flexibility to interpret the guides that best suit their needs. You don't hear a lot about tick requirements. Again, it's more towards agencies, the agencies of risk management solutions. Next slide, please. All the documentation from the CISA side that I mentioned before, uh, we are planning to release the documents that uh, released in December, the draft documents, even Jim talked a little about. Uh, those are gonna be released uh, in the summer 2020, sometime before end of September. The guidance themselves, uh, as you can find them on our website, uh, included in this uh, slide is the URL. Just if you go to one of your search engines and type in CISA and trust and internet connections, usually one of the first hits there. Next slide, please. Okay, use cases. This is where the focus is gonna be pretty quickly, and I'll talk about this in a moment. But the use cases themselves, uh, what they are for, they uh, account for that flexibility that's in the OMB memo, meaning those new architectures, those new technological advancements, but also recognize the attack patterns, like I mentioned before, are changing. And the proliferation of just cloud and mobile devices all warrant having more architectures, more use cases come out. So next slide, please. So this is a very high level slide and just to orientate you at the bottom, we're just about at the end of phase one and we're just about ready to start phase two. So phase one is all that guidance we released in December, the draft guidance, the guidebook architecture capabilities, that's, we're trying to get that out the door as fast as possible by uh, the uh, mid-September, I'm sorry, by the end of summer 2020. But once those documents are released, all that's just really the starting phase. Then we can start focusing on the use cases. They're outlined in the OMB memos. Uh, the OMB memo, I'm sorry, that's what we consider phase two. And then also we know there's all, uh, a number of potential use cases that agencies are interested in. We consider that phase three. So we're, again, we're just about the end of phase one. Then we'll work toward meeting the uh, use cases defined in the OMB memo, and then toward the potential, potential use cases after that. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just to orientate everyone. Aside from this webinar, uh, uh, we have an FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions, where we answer a lot of the common questions for the program. And then also GSA, Jim and Kevin's team, nice enough to host us for a webinar. There's a URL to look at the YouTube channel, to GSA's YouTube channel, to review this webinar. Next slide, please. And I think that's it. Okay. I think we're done, Kevin. Go ahead. Wow. That, that, that is a lot of info there. So, so thanks, Sean, Jim, JD. Um, well, why don't we go ahead and, and open it up to the audience for, for questions. I see we already have uh, uh, three questions here in the, uh, in the chat. It, uh, JD, that first one there looks like that's for you from, uh, from Duncan Thompson. You know, what's the status of CLAW? Is it ready for agencies to start sending logs to? And uh, are the interface details specified? So no, thank you. Thank you, Duncan, for asking that question. So the clause in the pilot phase right now, the, um, we, we are working with departments and agencies. And if this is something that uh, your department agency wants to do, 
the way that we, we've been going about it a number of different ways, right? Bringing both the agency and the vendor that they they want to, um, or the, the third party cybersecurity service vendor that they want to bring to the table and having a discussion with CISA. You know, at that point, we talked about basically the architecture. The interface details will be uh, released later on this summer when volume two, even though volume one does have a, a little bit of detail, but volume two is definitely a lot more detail. And so please feel free to reach out to the NCPS PMO office to, to work with us on how this can happen. But definitely we are ready to start piloting this with the department name because we, we have a number of them already piloted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Okay. I see that the, the second question there looks like that's one for you, Jim, about MTIPS being uh, available as an a la carte service. Okay. Yeah. That actually was an early thought of ours. Uh, and that's when you look at the managed security services uh, in EIS today, you'll basically see uh, MTIPS exploded into all its pieces um, as technical capabilities. And our thought was, well, if an agency wants to put together an MTIPS-like service, um, but not have the full package as it's defined, they certainly can do that using our managed security services. Uh, you know, going forward, you know, that's still possible. Uh, there, uh, you know, we really intend to provide a little more guidance there in terms of defining different packages that are relevant to the different use cases. But, uh, you know, so, you know, bottom line is you know, that's an available uh, uh, service. You know, just building a smaller MTIPS or, you know, the MTIPS Plus may not be the best solution going forward, depending on the agency network architecture or the requirements. Okay, and, and then the next question there, it's uh, nice we got these sequenced here. This one's, uh, looks like it's for Sean there from uh, Tom, uh, Tom Conway. Which, can you read the question, Kevin? I can't see the chat. I, can you explain the alignment between TIC 3.0, NCPS, and the new uh, QSMO, Quizmo organization? Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Um, hi, hi, Tom. So I hesitate to speak for Quizmo. That's a separate initiative altogether. And I, I, well, I'm just talking from the TIC program itself. The TIC program is focused toward the architectural guidance uh, that was released and th the use cases that we mentioned. Uh, we're, we're not, the TIC program itself is not affiliated with the, the Quizmo program. So um, there's, there's no I don't want to say alignment, but there's no effort by the TIC program to support TIC services to the agencies, if that's what the question is. Okay. Well, I see that, you know, one other question regarding the slides. Of course, the slides will be uh, made available after the briefing. Um, and another one there um, from Michael Mall. Will visibility provided to the agencies or things like claw. So that that that's an interesting question, and so I'm gonna take it at like take that approach, and kind of look at what we're doing now with Einstein, right? Where agency agencies do have access to the NetFlow logs that are collected currently, and so under that model, I I we will of course able have access to those logs, but. By visibility, did, did I capture the, the question correctly? Were you, were you asking, will agencies be able to see those flow logs or were you, okay. okay. I think uh, if I could just add one mention to what JD's talking about, the visibility, and it goes back to one slide JD had on the roles between the agencies and the vendors. Um, the telemetry that's coming out of the cloud environments, this is the telemetry that the cloud providers are providing the agencies. We're just looking for a subset of that telemetry. It's nothing, there's no proprietary um, telemetry that CISA is receiving. So all the telemetry that CISA is receiving should be part of, only a part of really what probably the agency's receiving internally also. So there's nothing, there's not a unique set of visibility towards uh, the cloud. Exactly, the logs that are generated by their environment to, to CISA. 
Okay. Well, I think any final questions here? Again, well, well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, thanks Dan Nancy Delanoche from the ACT IAC office for organizing and running the show. I, this, you know, of course, a big, big thank you to Sean, JD, and Jim. This is great information. I, I've, I've heard you brief a, a number of times, and every time I'm learning more and everything. I mean, this time, you know, some good information seeing about uh, Saturday.